Welcome to Golf Industry Guru and the Gig Podcast, where we interview the best and brightest golf and hospitality leaders on the planet. On today's episode, you will learn some proven real-world solutions that will help you and your team solve some of your biggest golf business challenges. So stick around for some tips, tools, and training to get you, your people, and your business powered on. Here's your host, James Cronk. Well, hello, Golf Industry Guru members, and welcome to another gig podcast. It is your host, James Cronk, and I am thrilled to be talking to a good friend of mine from down under, uh, Mike Orloff with Golf Industry Central. Although Mike has got a bit of a, an Australian twang when you uh, when he speaks uh, some words, but uh, <laughs> but you're going to learn about the fact that he's not born and bred there. But um, but Mike has got uh, well. First of all, he's just a fantastic operator with a great, lot of experience. Uh, Mike has been in the golf industry for many, many years. He's going to tell you about that. He's worked for some of the most significant golf management companies in the world. Um, and, uh, and I'm fascinated by his journey. I'm fascinated by, uh, you know, what he does now with, uh, with his business, with Golf Industry Central, with his consultant business and all the different things he gets into. Um, but mostly we're going to talk today about today's podcast, uh, about a, a topic that, well, it, you know, it's spoken about, but it's not often dealt with. And that is, and that is the fascinating topic of slow play. And, um, you know, what's interesting, of course, is that a few years ago when our golf courses were half empty, we didn't have to worry about slow play, uh, many of the times. But, uh, certainly, uh, these days, uh, with golf courses full and tee sheets full, no matter what part of the world in, this is always a, a topic. And Mike has, has I guess but it's become a bit of a pet project for him. So, um, so let me introduce Mike and uh, and Mike. Welcome to the Gig Podcast. No, oh, thanks, James. It's uh, it's great to finally catch up with you again. It's been a couple of years uh, since we've been in Asia at those uh, the conferences over there. I think that's where we first met several years back. So it's been great to see yes. you um, rolling this out. You know, one of your visions and um, you know, your passions. Um, you know, giving back to the industry, which I, you know, it resonates well with me because that's uh, it's probably some very similar journeys. You and I have similar haircuts as well, but I know they, the readers, yes. the listeners can't, can't see haircut. us, but we almost look identical. We almost could be brothers and brothers, you know. Yes. <laughs> well, you and I last connected in person uh, when we were in Thailand. We were yep. both speaking at the PGA uh, Education Conference, right, for the Asia PGA or for the PGA of Great Britain and yes, Ireland, yeah. but they were in Asia. And um, and uh, you gave a great presentation on the customer journey, which we're going to talk about in another uh, podcast later on. But um, but Mike, tell tell our listeners a little bit about about your your journey, yeah, uh, and about just kind of um, your experience and and uh, and your 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 world in the in the golf business. Yeah, well, I, and I'll, I'll try to keep it short, not to, to bore anybody. But uh, no, I was a late adopter to the golf game. So I was sixteen or seventeen. I was one of these. Um, had never even seen a golf course before. Didn't know what it was. And, um, you could drink beer and go out and play on it after surfing. So we went out and played golf and got into it, got into lessons and started getting serious about the game over those three or four years. And, um, and finally my golf professional at the time said, Hey, just, you, you should need to go work at a golf course. I'm like, okay, why is that? Uh, well, you'll get free golf balls and you know, get all the, all the perks, which was great. And that, I started working <laughs> yes. for a company called American golf corporation when I was 21 uh, as many of you would know in the, um, in the, in the U S market. Uh, and at that time they had 300 properties. So it was, it was never been part of a big corporation like that before. And that was the, probably the, that was the starting point of my journey in, uh, understanding the, this great industry. I, I was a wannabe golf professional, you know, as many of us are, um, never really got to <laughs> that good of a level as many of us haven't. And, uh, but I enjoyed operation. So I just, sort of did the stepping stones of picking range balls, washing carts, worked my way in the pro shop, learned about retail, and I worked my way up the ladder, um, become a, a PGA professional, a general manager, head teaching professional, worked in advance. I've worked across most areas of the, the, the industry in our clubs outside of food and beverage, probably the one area early on I didn't do. Uh, but yeah, uh, 10, 12 years into that journey, um, I got the opportunity with American Golf to come to Australia in, in 2000. Um, it was just one of those pivotal points in my life. Um, you know, my, my brother passed away at the time and 
just didn't been out of, you know, out of a serious relationship and just, just was sort of lost and said, you know, this, this just makes sense. I just want to go, go try it. Never been overseas to typical American. No, no passport. <laughs> never, never been anywhere except Hawaii. That was the, the furthest away. And, um, yeah, pl- plopped me over into where I live now on the Gold Coast, uh, which is the East Coast of Australia, which is very much like a Miami meets, um, um, Hawaii, or Waikiki, the big high rises on the beach, beautiful waves, uh, beautiful white sand beaches, um, and about 600,000 people. So all those great things, but no population. Um, that sounds gorgeous. Yeah. Yeah. It's great. I, you got to sort of pinch yourself. That's been 20 years. Um, you know, work, American golf, we had, I ran two resort properties over here and, and transitioned, um, those golf courses, uh, into the American golf, uh, operating procedures, uh, which we'll talk about here in a second, um, with, with pay supply, but yeah, just with these transitioning into a very commercial mindset and, and turning the business around in, in a very short amount of time, um, working with new culture, new staff, um, yeah, a lot of stuff to learn very, very quickly. Um, a few years in though, a couple of years in, that's when American golf was going through their downsize. And, um, I think they expanded too, too quickly in two thousands and, um, yeah, they pulled us back out of, out of, um, Australia. I ran two properties at that time. Uh, and then I came back and ran a, a high end five, five star, uh, Payne Stewart design golf course, uh, in just near Anaheim, near, um, uh, near Disneyland. So real high service level. So it's giving me this expansion of worked at a very, very busy, um, council courses with 85,000 rounds at $20 a round and, you know, just a d- different demographic, not that, you know, okay golf course. And then working at, at uh, Coyote Hills as the manager and having 300 events a year and, you know, five-star bag drop and great golf course and learned a lot and uh, took a lot out of me because it was, yeah, it was, it was pretty, pretty overwhelming at the time. It was just so much to learn. And um, during that time, I, I had met my, now uh my australian uh, girlfriend then and now my australian wife and have kids and yeah just uh yeah moved on over uh, moved back over and i uh, worked for club corp for a couple of years so i learned the whole club corp uh way of life with um the member side of things and and good customer service and you know real high value and a lot of this was created around the experience the customer experience um yeah, I got married and then, um, yeah, Club Corp left the, um, left Australia a couple of years later in 2004. And, uh, I just once again hit one of those little sliding door periods and, you know, little fork in the road and not sure what I wanted to do, but I wanted to take, take another big challenge. I, I, and I've always had that in my life. It's sort of I want to be a PGA pro. Okay. What do I need to do? Plan it all out and then get passion and go for it. And then finally achieve that. And I wanted to be a general manager. Same thing. What do I need to do? Learn work hard, achieve it. Okay. What's the next goal? And this was like, okay, you know, there's, there's an opportunity here. I don't know what it is. And I started my own media company, um, which is more of an online resource for the golf industry in, in this part of the world and uh, called golf industry central. And that's been going 13 years now producing, you know, news content from local and around the world just to share. I think if, if an industry is sharing, we'll, we'll all get better. Um, you know, as, as an industry. And, uh, now we run, you know, a lot of job advertisements and we do recruitments and, um, some marketing. So a whole host of, of things, but really in the golf space, um, which has been great. I've met some great people like yourself, James, you know, I, I wouldn't have been able to uh, head to Asia if I didn't have that platform. So it's opened a lot of doors for me and I, I've always been very organic on things. I just sort of feel I want to go down this way and right or wrong. Probably sometimes I, I wish I wasn't so organic, but you know, just see where we go and um, have a great time doing it. And um, like I said, I've just met some great people, um, you know, all, all along the way and yeah, just, just keep on going now. And, uh, now it's all about, um, I'm trying to find my, uh, you know, where's my passion and where's my, uh, the, the stuff that I really enjoy doing. You know, it was very broad at the beginning just to find out what the market wanted and how the market perceived me. But now I'm, you know, I'm finding the area that I really enjoy and going and, and doing presentations and facilitating workshops, sharing the education and knowledge of the last 30 years, um, you know, my growing up, not just in the industry, but just your experience of travel. I, you know, I got the travel bug, which is which is difficult at the time because we're not we're not traveling so much. Um, but yeah, just enjoying it, and um, yeah, this is where the whole customer experience and pay supply is a big big part of it. Um, not necessarily slow play, but the the whole pay supply area. Um, 
yeah, I just want people to come out and have a great time and, and, and tell their friends and want to come back again. And that's what we're all, we're in hospitality. And it's an area I never really thought of myself in, you know, as a hospitality person, but yeah, it's all just love it. You know, hospitality, even club, which I didn't, you know, not an area that I grew up with, but you know, the last six, seven years, I you know, really appreciate what that means. It's so true. That's good. That's good. And what I love about your stuff, Mike, and, and I've followed you for quite a few years now, you and I have had a chance to bump into each other and have conversations and, and meet other people <clears throat> like ourselves in the industry. Um, and what I love to, about your background is that you did it, right? Like, like yeah. sometimes we come across, you know, speakers or trainers or whatever, and, and they've got great stuff and they're, and they're great educators and they've got very good content, but sometimes they haven't actually done it. They haven't actually been in the trenches and had yeah. 15, 20 years of, of scrubbing hooks and, and, and <laughs> doing the, doing the day-to-day -day stuff. Right. And so, so I think that's so interesting for you, you know, and I, and, and that kind of journey. And in fact, you and I both kind of 13, 14, 15 years ago, left real day jobs to the get to a job where you don't know where your next paycheck's coming from, which yeah, is yeah, exactly which right. Is the, that's why we don't have hair anymore. I think that's, that's why I don't have hair anymore. Kids. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. Um so tell me tell me how you got well, obviously there's so many topics you could talk about and I know there's many topics you do talk about and you and you educate operators on and you're hired to give advice on. But let's today let's talk about pace of play and and yep. how did this topic even become, you know, something that's on your topic list? You know, like yeah. when I think about all the topics that are on my list, pace of play is not in the top ten. So I'm fascinated by how that came to you. Yeah, no, it it was part of that American Golf Days. I mean, I worked in the Southern California market. Um, our region was um, part of a lot, the 13 courses that were Los Angeles and just south of Los Angeles. And I worked at a facility called San Dimas, uh, Mountain Meadows, another council course, high volume, $20, $22 round, doing 110,000 rounds a year. I mean, just super, super high volume. Um, I learned a lot about T-sheet management. So that's another topic for another day. But um, but part of that was the, the pay supply. And in our region, we, as a company, we were pushing a lot of people through the course and not, and because we could, you know, it sounds bad, but because we could, we just had so much demand um, of people wanting to play and how many people we were turning away. And it just, just it was just crazy. And then things changed, you know, into the 2000, uh, late 90s, 2000, where more golf courses were being built. And then that, that pool of people diluted. So our customer experience side became more, um, more of a focus, you know, that, that, that people come and they want to come back. And that started turning and we were in the early days of like, wait, we've got a pace, pace issue. It's taken five and a half hours to play six hours, six and a half hours. I mean, we're just cramming people out there, but we never really understood. No one knew, understood what, how, okay, well, we'll go put a marshal out there. And it was sort of a re reactionary, re uh, reactionary thing to do. So myself and another, another guy uh, on opposite sides of the, um, um, of the region, we, we, we had a, we were a task force and we, 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 I was, oh God, I wish I, now I can't remember the name. He was, uh, I was pace and he was flow. And we had, we did this big presentation <laughs> around pace and flow because with pace supply, it's a, it's pace and flow. So, I mean, imagine this whole thing being on a motorway, a uh, highway or motorway. I'm not sure what you call it over there in Canada. Anyway, is it the same as the motorway? <laughs> sure. We'll yeah, call it a motorway. Yeah, I don't know. <laughs> I, a, I, road, I, yeah, a road, a road, a highway. Um, yeah, I, I forget where I'm at sometimes on which um, which terminology to use. But so we we were uh, we we got an assignment. So let's just go. Let's find out what the issue is. Let's get to the core of what's causing this problem. Why is some days it takes four hours, four and a half hours? Other days it takes five and a half hours. And it's you know it's it's pretty pretty basic stuff. But you know I sat out on the first tee. I get there on a Saturday and Sunday and just sat out there for before the first group went off and literally on a little palm card wrote what time they actually teed off stuck it on the on the on the buggy or the cart and they went off and i did every single one of those and then i waited for them to come around the uh and, and wrote it down on, a, on a, a tracking sheet and waited for them to come back around to the ninth hole and then i'd write when they went to the ninth hole and then when they came off 18 just it was just one one of the things i never read it i just read it anywhere to do that it was just okay i think that's what we need to do just okay let's do it and we did that for several weeks and then we consolidated and talked about it and you could see where it's like two wheels you know you'd see the groups going out really well and then about the sixth group out it's about 20 minutes behind and you go oh there you go there's 20 minutes um and then 
five or six groups later, there's another issue. And you can start seeing it now with GPS. You can do it e much easier. But the old school way of, you know, we just tracked it and did that for several weeks, measured it. And um, and just started seeing where the where the trouble problems were and who the people were. A lot of you know we had a lot of regulars and you know we saw that oh, okay, Mr. Jones, you're you know you're always going, you're always twenty minutes behind. And then we went deeper and we started going out on the golf course and watching which holes would back up. Um, at what point does it slow down? You know, and just doing that type of measurement type of uh, approach to things and seeing where the issues were. So I went through all that thing and, you know, um, and right. And so that we, uh, we came up with our best practice at that time. That was uh, 99, probably 1999. And um, yeah, just came up with best practice. We shared it across the, the, the region and we all got a little bit better, not a huge amount, but did get better because we we're managing it now versus just letting it happen and let things go to just to chance. Mm -hmm. And, um, yeah. And, uh, and then fast forward, that, that was it. And then I moved to Australia. didn't really have that, that type of, um, uh, focus. Um, you know, I was looking at bigger picture and then I wrote, when I started golf industry central, I, one of my first articles I wrote was about, you know, pay supply. Who's that, who's, who's in, who's in control or who's at fault and threw it out on social media and you get all these funny reactionary thing. It's suppliers, it's this, it's that. And yeah, it's really, it's, it's a management issue. It's us is the managers. We need to manage that, that experience. We need to manage that, uh, that part of the process, that part of the journey of when they, when they, when they come to your facility and, um, had written that article. And then, uh, all of a sudden I, I, I did a lot of web, web research for my, um, for my news, uh, news blogs and, um, I saw an article with uh, Bill Yates, who's the you know the guru of, of um, the pace of play guru. Unfortunately, he passed away in June of 2018. Mm -hmm. um, and I reached out to him, and he had a, his pace management systems, and he took a real um, he's an in uh, some kind of in uh, not electrical engineer, but an engineer by trade. So he just did these manpower mm -hmm. studies, real real technical. Uh, he had a passion for it. Same thing. And uh, he lived up at, uh, at Pebble Beach, and uh, he started just trialing and taking numbers and figuring out what's going on, and figuring out well, how, how do we fix this? You know, he saw it was a big problem, and he took that that one issue and and just ripped it apart and built it back up again. And he, he has a book out now that, uh, unfortunately, after he passed, called Out of Time. Um, that his his wife was nice enough to send to me. Um, I haven't got all the way through it yet, but um, just haven't had the time, ironically. <laughs> um, <laughs> But um, I, I, so I reached out to Bill and had a couple of conversations with him. This would have been back um, five, three, four, five, four or five years ago. And um, we would started doing phone calls and uh, I basically mentored me on. We had so many things that I just out of chance figured out. He had actually written the book on it. And I went, wow, like, OK, I was actually I was pretty close. Like I was really, I was, I was really yeah. proud of myself going, wow, I sort of figured this out. I had no, I mean, I'm not, I'm not college educated. I just, I sort of learn, learn as I go. And, um, yeah, he just, we just had these great conversations and I finally got him over for a, um, a road show. So I got him over to, to Australia for 10 days and hooked him up at, a, an event, um, to, um, um, just talk about the subject, a big, big conference. And we did a couple of projects with some of the, you know, some of the Sandbelt courses and did some, you know, presentations. And I just had 10 days to just pick his brain and talk about things. And what about this? What about that? How, you know, what happens? And, um, yeah, I was just very fortunate to have that time with him and, and, um, and learn so much. And so it's always resonated there, you know, but, but since his passing, I, I haven't focused as much on, you know, I, I like that education piece. I like to help clubs get a better product for their, for their members or their guests. And, um, mm -hmm. yeah, so, so I just wanted to just, yeah, just tandem things that we had this you know, cross crossover for a couple of years that, um, Yes, went and there's nobody really doing it in that way too. The the, the philosophical, the why, the why behind things is a big big part of my thinking. Say, yeah, you know? yeah. I mean, you know, we can we can find lots of different technology and tools and systems and tags and GPS to tell us that we have slow play. Yes, <laughs> it's uh, exactly. It's really a question. how we how do we prevent slow play? So so Mike, what are what are like what are some of the the core elements in your yep. experience or your conversation with bill or or your 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 own your own discoveries um you know if you're if you're we're talking to club operators right so yeah we've got on our platform here a bunch of club operators but golf professionals directors of golf general managers course owners <clears throat> if you were going to stand in front of them and talk to them about look here's the things about slow play that you might not know or pace of play 
you yeah. might not know what what are what was what are some of those things yeah no no it's great uh, there's something that's um you know bill and, and and you know taking it from greg patterson's uh book is yeah you when you learn something you make it your own ideal you steal it and make it your own <laughs> yes. uh, and i'll talk about yes. that in another time with, with my time with greg but it's, um <laughs> It is about, you know, it was a passion area, something that I I really believed in and actually did it for, for, you know, six, 12 months was, was reviewing it and really digging into it and understanding it. Now, you know, the the role I play now is how to educate it. Um, There's three currencies. So there's the time currency, of course. So, you know, if it's, if you're out on the golf course and it takes five hours, four hours, three hours, whatever, or personal time on what someone has, and these are more macro issues. So there's a, there's a time currency, how much you paid, you know, the money element. And then the, the most important one. Um, with with pay supply or service or customer experience or whatever we talk about is this emotion and marketing is the emotional currency. So how do how do you feel when you're out on the golf course? Are you frustrated because it's you're having to wait? Are you frustrated because the greens are crap? Uh, are you frustrated because your playing partner is not very nice or whatever it is that plays into your whole experience. Um, but with, when it comes to the pace of play portion of that, that uh, customer experience, there's five things. There's top uh, f- uh, five. There's a lot of different issues, but th- you can narrow them down to five. The RNA, who took a lot of Bill's work, he, he worked with early on too. In the, there's a um, pace of play book from the RNA. So that's a starting point if they want to see it. Um, he's referenced in the back, but you know, they've, they've narrowed it to three. They sort of lumped it in. But his five and the five is really the length of the golf course dictates how long it should take to play the golf, uh, the play. So there's a, a misnomer, um, a myth um, about how long it should be a four hour round. But if you play a golf course, say in Palm Springs, where there's, you know, there's two kilometers between holes, that's going to add time uh-huh. on. You can't play in four hours or you, you know, yeah. so pe- people have a, a, a myth of how long it should play. It should take to play. So if you go anywhere, Oh, well, I, sh- I played my other course and it takes me three hours and 50 minutes. So it should take three hours. Of- well, now that's bull. But the thing that's static is the length of your golf course, which is the length of the course, but more importantly is the distance between the holes. Mm-hmm. So if you have mm-hmm. to go from, once you get off the green, you have to go to the next tee. How far is that? And that mm-hmm. all adds up in time. So that's, starting point if i could probably double up here you know how to fix it is well that's a starting point you got to measure it and come up with your your sort of benchmark of what should it take to play um the course setup is another big aspect so yeah play it on um let's just say you're having your your monthly medal event and it's uh it's a stroke round and you're playing everybody from the tips and the rough is you know three inches long and it's like it's going to be a slow day just realize that so setting up the course and your average player at your course is a 25 marker okay yeah you've got some issues already before you even start on the day um there's a course we worked in with in sydney a real high-end one and you know the members have been there for 20 30 years and they want they join because it's a really tough golf course slick greens rough but now, 30 years later they're 75 85 years old <laughs> they can't reach the fairways and they can't stop the grains. They can't do a lot of things, uh, but they still want it that way. And it's, it can be slow out there, you know, because mm-hmm. of the course setup. and you try to change the course setup, they're going to be upset. So the, the player, um, the course setup is a, a, a second part of it. Player skill. So, yep. You've got a bunch of 30 markers. You've got a bunch of one markers. Um, not to say, you know, that a one marker can still be slow. Um, their behavior. So, you know, do they just take their time, you know, not, you know, not do all this, the the best practice of carry all your golf clubs with you if you're you know, if you if you you don't have the bag with you or you know if you're coming off your cart. So there's all those type of things. Are they taking too long over shots? Are they chitty chattering? They're on their phone. All that type of stuff that that comes into play. And then the biggest one, uh, not the biggest one, but the you know, the one that I see that we actually have a lot of control over because length of course is by design, so we can't mm-hmm. really change that very easily. No, um, the player skill same thing we can't really change that maybe give them lessons or improve but you know that's not it's not out, up out of our control it's a setup we can control um, but yeah the management policies and procedures so pay, that course setup would be part of that so how do we you know what are the intervals of them going off the golf course um, what's the expectation that we've set with them how do we manage them when they're they're slow who's the marshal type of type of scenario um yeah, do you do member education nights do you um you know 
do you put tips out on how to make it better? And, you know, do we put the pins at easy spots on busy days and make it in hard, you know, harder spots on other days? And so all those types of things that we have control over, uh, how we set the golf course up. So if it's a par five, do you make it really a very long par five or do you make it a really short par five? Par, th- par threes were one that, that I found in that, those, that early example of, um, where there was an issue is that we had a par three that was 185 yards and it was more of a par three and a half for the people that played there. Most people didn't reach the green. Even though there was nothing in front of it, there was no bunkers. It was just a straight shot. Mm-hmm. They couldn't reach the green. So mm-hmm. so they'd hit, and then they'd have to drive up and then get out, and then they have to hit the pitch shot. But so they're waiting. That hole always backed up. And I just kept saying that. Going, Why is that hole backing up? Okay, well, let's make it on weekends when we're super busy. Let's make it 155 yards. Still mm-hmm. good hole. Yeah. It just unhooked it, you know, just took mm-hmm. it. And the fact is the hole before it can also cause it, uh, cause an issue. Um, yeah. If it's too, uh, too short or plays too fast, which we had a par five that played really fast. It was more of a, a par four or and a half. Um, mm-hmm. So they, people were coming off that hole too fast and then they go to a hole that was taken too long and you got a bunch of mm-hmm. them. So we spread it out. So it's a lot of this pace of play stuff is around the spread. If you think about, if you fill up a, a tank of, uh, uh, what's the best example, a sink of with water and you unplug it and let all the water go out and you have the tap going on at the same time, if you turn it on too much, eventually the water can't go through the tap, right? It starts backing up. So the key mm-hmm. in flow is to get the water to come out and to go through the hole at basically the same pace at all times and just keep mm-hmm. it staggered and that spacing. So one of the other myths for me that I see is, oh, keep up with the group in front of you. And then you know what? It's bull. (laughs) Yes, in theory, but really, depending on your golf course and the intervals, you probably don't. Sometimes having a a buffer like that is okay because going down the next two or three holes later, where there's normally a backup, there won't be a backup because it'll actually. Mm. A flow flow through better if that if that makes sense because it's Mm -hmm. um, we just Mm -hmm. it's like an accordion if they start coming too close together. If there's a backup, there's no room for it to spread back out. So having that interval of eight minutes or nine minutes perfectly going in assembly line fashion is the ideal thing. So what is the what is your interval? That's that's something that comes out of the reviews I do. You sort of measure, and then you, you then you go on course and actually you measure the length of the course and what it should like take to play, and then you start measuring uh, the groups that are going off. And asking them, you know, how you know, or getting them to be regulated, because you'd be surprised if you spend spend a couple hours on a Saturday morning and and measure out when people tee off. And a tee off is when the last person hits the ball in that group. So it's the last person, not the first person. Always do the last person, fourth person off, third person off, next group, third person off. See if they actually tee off on time. Mm-hmm. It's, um, you know, if they're actually going off at the at the right. T- Sorry, it's actually the other way around. <laughs> first person off. Yeah, it, it's when they tee off, bang start your start the clock and then the next first group that goes the first person that goes off in the next group and see what those intervals are and how that matches up against your t-sheet and you'll you'll normally see that you know there's a bit of a stagger some groups go off faster fairways clear oh go ahead and hit it's like well no let's stop you and let's hold you back for a couple of minutes and it's hard for members mm-hmm. to do that because they think oh that'll stay up the group in front of you it's like no the interval is eight minutes Keep it at eight minutes. Otherwise, you're going to stick to it. Yeah, stick and to it. Sometimes hole, you'll, hard have a, for, you'll have a backup. Sorry. Yeah, and, it's, and sometimes it's hard for starters to follow the process and to, you know, use their watch and not get lazy and just kind of look down the fairway and say, okay, you know, time to go. Um, yeah. A, a couple of thoughts crossed my mind. Uh, you know, one is I always laugh about – well, don't laugh. Like – why is it that golf has become this kind of time currency? Like, like if you go skiing, right? You yep. know, no one talks about the fact that, hey, guess what? I went skiing in four and a half hours. You know, it was yeah. like, it yep. was fantastic. You know, you know, you get to the bottom of the hill on a Saturday and there's 500 people waiting in line. You just know it's a busy Saturday, you know, yep. and you, as opposed to a Monday, if you get down there and there's 50 people in line. So I always, I think it's so interesting how, I uh, see, I believe the little bit that the golf industry puts too much emphasis on the urgency of the time currency. Okay. Yep. So, so I believe that, that we create our own monster sometimes by um, talking about the fact that people have a time crunch and people need to get things done and people have other things to do. No, if they're experiencing something fantastic, 
and they're having a wonderful time outside getting exercise with their friends or their kids or their spouses or whatever it might be. And they're having, and then, then those other currencies, right, become that the emotional currency becomes way more greater yep. than the money currency and the time currency. Um, and I also, I also prefer to kind of think about the experience as in the, the preference of the experience is what I like to call continuous play. Yep. It's like, it's like in a perfect world, a good pace is that everyone in that entire day has continuous play from the moment you start to the moment you end and that you're able to maximize your T-sheet. I mean, at yeah. the end of the day, you maximize your... And that's, that, and that's flow. Yeah, that's the flow yeah, aspect that's flow, of it. Right? So, you can bet, you know, if you get on the, on the motorway and you go and you get in traffic, uh, I grew up in California, so you know, Los Angeles traffic is, um, is crazy. But if everybody just drove it, you know, 30 miles an hour and kept the space and just everybody, you would, you would get there probably faster than stop, go, yes. stop, go, stop, go. And that's where the frustration comes in. As we know, is that stop, you can't get right. into a, a mental uh, mindset of playing the game and that flow of the game. So flow is that critical part. That's that real emotional one. Um, I've, I've played somewhere and I hate to say it took us, it was a, a at Riviera um, a week or so before the PGA championship back in the nineties. And we got the opportunity to pros to go out and play there, but the rough was uh, a couple, a couple inches, like never played it a couple inches deep and narrow fairways. Just, it took us five and a half hours, but it didn't feel like five and a half hours. I mean, we just kept yeah. flowing, but you know, the people behind us probably weren't too happy, but, I was just went, oh, okay. Well, God, that was five and a half hours, really? Like, we know it was just a slow flow uh, yeah. versus quick flow. Uh, but the pace, yeah, if you're getting a, you know, stop, go, stop, start, that's um, that's where the real frustration you know, comes in. So I fully agree with it. And that's the experience. And I, I guess it's that, you know, you got to know about that expectation of when a, a, a member or guest comes and they're expecting to play faster than it really is. Um, you know, as a manager, we can sometimes set that expectation before they go off and go, Hey guys, it's you know, we, 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 just to set your expectation. It's, it's, it, we're playing about four and a half hours today. So just, you know, we apologize, yeah. but you know, that's, that's sort of where it is. We've had a big, big groups out there has been said, you know, you're off at one o'clock in the afternoon. Yeah. You know, you're behind everybody. Um, yeah. Or, or Mike, or Mike that, you know, listen, our time par is yep. four hours and 25 minutes. Yep. Today we're right now we're playing at four hours and thirty minutes. Yep. You know, so we're five minutes off. Hopefully that'll pick up during your day today, ladies and gentlemen. Yep. Uh, but go have a wonderful time. The sun's up. Be thankful you're alive. <laughs> um, <laughs> That's right, Mike. So, so when you work with a club, and and so just as we kind of get to the end of this wonderful chat, because we talk about this for so much, and Bill Yates, yeah. this what a guru, yeah, right? What a what a what a wealth of information, but. What do you think? What are some if you're if you're an operator, an owner, operator, manager, and you've identified the fact you've got a pace play problem, you can't change the length. Yep. You can set your time par. You can train your marshals. You can TP people at the right time. What are what are some other things that you would you would guide them to, or or, or even prioritize as far as what are some of the things that's going to have probably the best impact on pace to play challenges. Yeah. Well, with anything we do, James, you know, it's, um, it, it, you, you mentioned the time par and that's, that's the starting point. We need a benchmark. So we need some, some data and I, yes, we're in a technology world now where it's a lot easier to get that stuff. There's a couple of big companies that, uh, that, that, um, that focus in on that. I know that, that the GPS providers have some kind of pace to play thing if everybody's writing. Um, but that's the met, that's the measurement side. So let's get back to that. We need to know what we're measuring against. So if it's time par, um, you know, for that co- that specific co- uh, course, you need to measure that first, and mm-hmm. then that's the starting point. It's four hours and fifteen minutes, it, it, and that and that's what yeah. it is. You know what? If you get better uh, faster than four fifteen, well done. But four fifteen is our is, is that's our 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 target line. Yeah, and then to clarify, <laughs> if I may, like sometimes your time par between seven a.m. and nine a.m. is different than your time par between nine and twelve, and yep. twelve and four, and four to six. Yeah. Yeah, and now in a perfect world is when it, when it comes to product 
quality. So the, the, the pace of play is a product, right? Or the golf course is a product. So what, what do we normally look at first? We go, we want good grains. We want good fairways. Yeah. If you, if, if there was anything, you make sure you have good grains, you know, then you have to, mm-hmm. you know, it should be good fairways. And the last thing is sort of tees and then everything else. You shouldn't be in the rough. And oh, by the everything. way, the studies show that after good greens, next to most important thing is a good hot dog. But, <laughs> okay. I didn't know that. Yeah. yeah that's, what, that's, that's what every study shows. Is good that greens, your study? Good hot dog. <laughs> It might be my study. Yeah, my study. Oh, that, oh, that, that's an issue. Oh, that, um, that was, <laughs> you got, got me out thinking of hot dogs now. Um, yeah, so setting your time part. Like anything, we're on business, right? So we're, we're numbered. We're number driven. And people, even though they're not thinking a number, they're thinking that emotional thing. So let, let, let's, let's get that time par. Um, and then start looking at how the course is set. And then, I'm sorry, time par. And then measure, t- spend a couple weekends or busy days, just a random or Wednesday, whatever your, your competition days are or Saturdays, and just do some random measuring. It could be for the whole day. Just have someone sit out there and go, okay, first ball off is 8.01. You know, tea time was eight, went off at 801. You know, uh, next group was, uh, you know, it was eight minutes later or something. Then you start seeing it like it just pops out straight away where your issues are. Mm-hmm. And, but at least you can start getting it's supposed to be four hours and 15 minutes to play. Our par actual now is 430. So all we're really trying to do is shave 15 minutes off, right? We're not trying to shave half hour, hour and be stupid. We just want to make some incremental changes. Um, so then look at, then dig, you know, once you have that sort of, um, that time difference that you're trying to, to, trying to shave off, start digging deeper to where, where that issue might be. Look at course setup. That's typically where the, those are things that we have control over straight, first and mm-hmm. foremost. You're right. We can't really change the course, but we can, because if you have a very short par four, very long, you know, long par mm-hmm. three, um, hitting over water, whatever, you know, those types of factors, we can do something. Maybe it's putting a new tee box in or something. I know Bill always used the one at, at Pebble, uh, the whole six going into seven. So seven is a really short par three, but six is par five, I think. Um, so he actually made the hole longer because people were bunching up on seven. So yeah, that's all he did. So that they the, couldn't get home in two on six. Yeah. Just make it a tougher, well, except for Tiger. <laughs> but yeah, but yeah, I mean, yeah, exactly right. So they're stretching it out. So there's actually making a three shot hole versus a maybe a two shot hole. And then they come off too quick. So it's all about that, how fast they're playing holes. Um, and then you can go dig deeper and dig, dig deeper. But normally you'll find a couple of the, the issues stand out pretty quickly. And that's usually just with, okay, where are the backup holes? You know, your marshals are saying hole number six or seven is always the one backing up. Okay, just focus on that. What, what's causing that? So the way the setup, is it the, um, you know, the length of the rough? Is it, um, is it water hazards where you can't see the ball going to water and people stopping and searching? And you, know, you start digging deeper. And that's the work I do when I do it in person. Yeah, that's the work I learned a lot from Bill is just going out and, and spending a day out there and just tracking and watching and seeing and, and evaluating. And then from there, you come up with a plan of action and say, look, we're going to do these are our three things that we're going to work on for the next three months. Focus on that and then measure and then go back and measure again. So it's, it's pr- pretty common, common sense and just and adjust and measure, adjust, manage. You no, know, because your players are your players. So, I mean, if there's a problem with the, with high handicappers wanting to play the black tees, pretty straightforward isn't it? it's not it's not rocket science it's not it's not like it has to be perfect just do it a little bit you'll have a big big impact um to your point well, what, to, what, I, what, I, what i like sorry go ahead you know and say to your point about the playing in the morning it might be slower in the afternoon now really in concept of like an assembly line as an engineer would have thought like bill is the product you get in the morning you're paying full rack and the product at 12 o'clock you're paying the same price you theoretically should get the same product, which is the golf experience or the the pace of play. If you went into a restaurant in the morning and you know, or on a Monday and got a, a a nice sandwich, and you went back on the same restaurant on a Friday, you should get the same experience, same meal, the same thing on the same day. So, really, we're talking about product quality here, the quality of the of the round. It doesn't matter what time of day, you know, because the problem is we're not managing it, we're not keeping that 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 flow or that um, that those intervals through the whole day. You should, but I would propose to you that we do we, what we fail to do often is we fail to set expectations. Yep. And if I walk into a restaurant on a Friday night at six thirty and it's packed and there's a lineup of forty people, the hostess is going to lo- hopefully tell me that just so you know we're packed yep. and it might take you a couple more minutes to get a drink or to get your meal. 
uh, as opposed to if I go there for lunch at 11 o'clock and there's nobody there, right? So, But if you so, order the same uh, meal, I guess what I'm getting at. Of course. Order, yeah, if you order the same meal. Of course. So it, it's so of the, course. The pace of play is a product, not necessarily the time, but the product that we're offering on the course is, is, is part of that, is the course setup, the quality of the course, conditioning, and then the time that it takes to play. So if you've got a member paying $3,000 a year to be – you know, play seven days a week and they play Saturday morning at six, they're getting around quickly. That same, another member is paying exactly the same amount at, at but they play at 1130. It takes them four hours to play, four and a half hours to play. Mm-hmm. There's not, so the, the, the ideal place that we want to get to our goal would be to get it. So it's perfect intervals throughout every day. And you, you actually get more people out that way. Even at nine minutes, you possibly get more people through because more people Correct. start, they get out faster versus put um, piling them on and they take longer to get off. Correct. Cause that's one of the other myths. Oh, it's going to cost me money. If you do it right, it actually will give you better quality. You can probably charge more because of it. And then three mm-hmm. is, um, yeah, just that, that, um, you know, the, the better experience overall, you know, with, with, with what they're getting. What I think is fascinating is that I still come across operators every once in a while that, that really are always shocked when they have a slow play problem. <laughs> it's like, it's like, you know, Oh, it must be the golfers from Timbuktu that have shown up or it must be yeah. this, or it must be that. I'm just like, I'm like, no, chances are it's because, you know, you're not sending them off properly. The golf course, the, the, you know, the superintendent was having a bad morning and put the pins <laughs> tucked in the back corner of every yep. green. You know, I mean, there's all kinds of other reasons that these, that these things happen. It's not all. Yeah. It's not always the golfer's fault. Yes. Uh, for goodness sakes, and yeah. and some sometimes you find people or operators or or you know, actually more fairly, sometimes you'll find less educated employees or marshals that will assume that it's just the golfer's fault and they don't look at all the other things like you talk yeah. about, about time par or about setting people off the right way, course setup, all these types of things. Yeah. And I, I mean, some of it's the, um, I mean, as you dig deeper into some of the factors, you know, these are those core factors, those top five to look at within each of those, there's, you know, there's several other factors that, that can contribute that that's just basically categorized in that area. But even your, your green staff, a lot of places, the green staff doesn't, that don't even play golf. They don't mm-hmm. see it through a golfer's mindset. Um, as a man, you know, managing facilities, I always, and I'm sure most do, is I spend, you know, a day or a day, but a morning, a week with my superintendent. And we go mm-hmm. walk the golf course, not the mm-hmm. play necessarily, but go walk it versus riding it. Because riding it, you you can, you, you drive over things really quickly. You miss it. Or mm-hmm. I used to go play once a month. I'll go play with the ladies on ladies day and play from the, the forward tees or whatever tee box mm-hmm. they were playing. Um, or women. So I know the terminology now is not, not correct with using ladies, but, um, but I wanted to see through their eyes on what they were experiencing. So it's a, mm-hmm. it's a golf course experience. So if, if you know, I'm a, mm-hmm. uh, you know, golf professional, so I, I'll play from the back tees and I'll have a certain experience, but what about all your 25 markers that, you know, are playing from the forward tees or, you know, the women's tees or whatever tees you have set up, you know, how do they see it? Are they running into the bunkers? Is there areas that are, you know, dead turf or, you know, are they running into the water? You know, uh, can they carry bunkers, you know, for, you know, shorter hitters that can't get the ball up in the air or no spin, you know, how is the whole setup? So really we want to make sure we look through the lens of all these different types of players. And then our, our green staff should play the golf course once in a while and see, <laughs> set it up properly. And, you know, if they don't play, you know, there's a lot of superintendents don't even play golf. And it's like, okay, well, you're, you're doing a great job, but you don't play. So you can't see it through the eyes of a golfer. Well, and they also don't, don't realize that we make a lot more money when people make birdies than when they make double bogeys. <laughs> that's true. And that's just a fact. So depend, you know, you know, obviously everyone's got a different brand. You got a different experience. You might yep. have a different kind of pro- property. There's, there's, there's a golf course for every level of every age, but, but at the end of the day, we're trying to make people feel good when yeah, they that, walk off 18, not exactly. like they've been kicked in the shins for yeah. four and a half hours. Yeah. And, that, and that's that emotional currency, right? You came off of it. You played with some nice people that you may or may not have known before you, you teed off with strangers and you end up being friends at the end. I mean, how great, I mean, what other sport? I mean, this is why we're, we both love this sport. It's like how, how it doesn't matter the age bracket as well. I, I, I'm happy to play with anybody, you know, because, um, 
you know, not for money, but, <laughs> but you know, move around, play with different people. Cause there's so many, we all love the same game. So uh, for me, game the, of lifetime, the, 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 yeah, the, the, the pace of play is, is, is one part of this whole customer experience. And that's the area that's just one element of it in golf, but the cut, you know, that emotional attachment, people know, you know, people come in, you know, who they are, they feel warm and welcome home away from home, all that type of stuff that we, you know, we've been, been um, learned over the years, you know, and that comes back to staff and just, you know, make people have that warm, fuzzy thing. And if the course is too hard and they're losing golf balls, yeah, you know, we had one place uh, around over here, had a lake on uh, 17 holes. So you did not get, away from and the and the uh, fairways cambered so they cambered <laughs> into the water so if you weren't on the fairway you were in the water and it's great we yes. saw a lot of, a lot of golf balls a lot of sure. secondhand and um and and cheap golf balls but yeah that was uh, yeah it hurts the ego <laughs> you don't want to go back why would i go there it cost me another 30 dollars to big golf balls well that's a great segue mike because yeah. that's going to lead into our part two of our podcast with mike orloff from golf industry central which is about the customer experience, but for now we're going to um, we're going to wrap up this podcast about pace of play, uh, pace and flow. I loved how you described that, and uh, and so many great takeaways. So, uh, Mike, thank you so much for uh, for being our our guest here on uh, the Gig Podcast, and uh, and a lot of great uh, takeaways. We could we could talk for hours because I yeah. uh, it made me create even more questions about pace of play, and I'm actually going to ask you one when we get into our next. Uh, yep. session which we're going to start in a minute so um, ladies and gentlemen I invite you to uh, to listen to part two of our podcast with uh, Mike Orloff but uh, Mike thanks so much for the, for this one yep my, my pleasure thanks for listening to the gig podcast we hope you enjoyed this episode and mostly that you learned a few things that will help you improve your business join us next time as we continue to bring you the best and brightest golf and hospitality leaders on the planet thanks for listening